you're probably getting a little sick of seeing me. Um, one quick administrative announcement before we go on. I've had a number of people come up, which is really exciting to me, to ask questions about um, what it might take in the future or tomorrow to become a program manager at DARPA. And we forgot to tell you that folks from our strategic resources office, strategic res resources means human resources, um, are actually at a table right outside in the registration area. So they're there to answer your questions and help you figure out what, you know, what kinds of paths forward there might be. And they will also be at a table at lunch today during the networking time. So um, please feel free to get to know them. So I get to rejoin you now with the distinct pleasure of welcoming to DARPA Forward Dr. Kath Hicks, the 35th Deputy Secretary of Defense of the United States, joining us virtually today. Throughout her career within the Department of Defense, Dr. Hicks has provided guidance on global and regional defense policy and strategy, including for future capabilities, overseas military posture, and contingency and theater campaign plans. She's also served as Senior Vice President, Henry A. Kissinger Chair, and Director of the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as a Senior Fellow for that organization. If you've been following her work since she, was, since she was sworn in last year, you know that she cares deeply about the issues that we're tackling here at DARPA Forward. Issues such as advancing US strategic capabilities, ensuring the vibrancy of the US research and development innovation ecosystem, and retaining talent and bringing in fresh perspectives from across the spectrum of sectors and disciplines. Dr. Hicks, welcome to DARPA Forward, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction. I know it's been said at DARPA that if you don't invent the internet, you get a B. And so everyone works really hard to try to earn their A, whether it's stealth or handheld GPS or a vaccine platform using mRNA technology. While history always has the final say, I'll just say that from my perspective, after visiting DARPA headquarters this spring, where I was briefed on several cutting edge programs geared toward our most pressing security challenges. Based on that, I have faith high marks will be in order. And Stephanie, I'm especially grateful for the vision you've brought to creating this DARPA Forward series of events. Taking DARPA's crown jewel of national security innovation on the road, getting out of DC and connecting with existing and emerging hotbeds of science and technology, research and development, Plugging in to regional innovation hubs that don't often have easy opportunities to engage with our defense mission, but have so much to contribute. And it's clear why you're starting in the Mountain West, because it's a place where innovation happens at the intersection of industry, academia, and government. With pathbreaking research and development from Colorado State University and all along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. With a vibrant private sector that includes everything from local startups working on battery technologies to multi-tech firms developing enterprise software, and with a forward-thinking Fort Collins city government that created its own futures committee to look 20, 50, even 100 years out to spot challenges and seize opportunities. It's just the kind of mix that allows world-changing ideas to bubble up into existence, like the pioneering energy efficiency demonstration Fort Zed, whose innovation ideas for clean energy generation, distribution, and use were so compelling, they took root in the broader community. That innovative spirit is exactly why I wanted to speak with you today, because connecting with America's many innovation hubs across the country has been a priority for me as Deputy Secretary of Defense. It's why I've engaged with researchers at Caltech who are working on everything from climate and sustainability to space and autonomy, with biotechnologists in Boston who are engineering novel medical treatments, with commercial tech entrepreneurs in Austin, Texas, who are using 3D printing to break the mold of how we maintain aircraft and other mechanical systems, and with electrical engineers and engine designers in Detroit who are figuring out how to make our power grids more secure and our military vehicles more energy efficient. Like me and probably many of you, they love rolling up their sleeves to crack open a problem and craft a solution no one's thought of yet. And they're eager to lend their expertise to help solve the biggest challenges we face for the good of our country and the world. As you've probably gathered over the last day and a half in the Department of Defense, there's no shortage of big challenges that we're thinking about every day. We face a pacing challenge in the People's Republic of China, which is today the most consequential strategic competitor to the United States on the global stage. 
We face in Russia an acute threat to the international system, as illustrated by its ongoing brutal war of choice against Ukraine. We face persistent regional threats, like those emanating from North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. And we face threats that transcend national and regional borders, including pandemics like COVID-19 and climate change. To be clear, the United States faces these many challenges with many strategic advantages, and you're one of them. All over America, we have an incredibly vibrant innovation ecosystem that is the envy of the world. DARP is part of it, and so are all of you. Because of this innovation ecosystem, which also draws strength from our partnerships with like-minded friends and allies around the world, we're able to figure out some really wicked problems like how to resupply and reinforce Army and Marine Corps units spread out on islands across half a hemisphere with capabilities like distributed additive manufacturing and proliferated low signature delivery systems so they can operate and be sustained no matter what an enemy does or how contested the logistics environment gets. Or how we integrate sensors and fuse data across every domain while leveraging cutting edge decision support tools to enable high tempo operations. A joint all domain command and control approach that will make us even better than we already are at joint operations and combat integration. To help us solve these challenges, DARPA is doing what it's always done well. Looking over the horizon and around corners to prototype and experiment and drive forward science and technology breakthroughs for our national security. For example, DARPA's Engineered Living Materials Program, where you can spray an algae-based substance onto a patch of dirt and it grows into a landing pad that's hard enough to safely take off and land a helicopter on it. A potential game changer for distributed forces operating from remote islands in the Indo-Pacific and other austere environments. And there are many more innovative technology areas we're investing in, like resilient space architectures, advanced engines, and hypersonics. It's all part of why, in President Biden's defense budget request for this coming fiscal year, we've made the largest ever investment in research and development. Because innovating and innovation and modernization is key to building enduring advantage, a core pillar of our national defense strategy. Of course, it's not just about the technological capabilities themselves. Equally important is how we use our capabilities through novel and innovative operational concepts and making concept design and development part of how we do prototyping and experimentation. That's why we're investing in creative concepts and capabilities that make our forces harder to target, whether in the air, on land, or at sea, from the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, magnetic, excuse me, spectrum to space to cyberspace. And we're investing in novel capabilities and concepts that make it harder for potential adversaries to apply their own systems to threaten our forces or inject uncertainty into those systems. Disrupting adversary kill chains or what the military calls C5 ISRT is a prime focus. For decades, DARPA has had this mindset, thinking about concepts and capabilities together at the core of its use-inspired research and development. The original Assault Breaker program is a great example. In the late 1970s, DARPA integrated several technologies, lasers, electro-optical sensors, microelectronics, data processors, and radars that could enable US forces to strike battlefield targets with pinpoint accuracy. The result was what we now call precision guided munitions, smart bombs. But the United States didn't develop that technology or others just for the sake of it. There was a clear use case in mind, an operational concept, that we could use it to pierce and disrupt the seemingly endless waves of Soviet tanks and troops that we and our NATO allies would have faced if a war broke out in Europe. That combination of concepts and capabilities, which was demonstrated in the early 1980s in a way the Soviets were sure to notice, gave our competitors real pause. It punctured their certainty in the effectiveness of their forces. The result was effective deterrence. We didn't have to break through any Soviet military assaults because we broke their confidence. And the job doesn't stop with prototyping and experimentation. More than ever before, we also have to think about what comes next. Like how do we transition our most effective prototypes to become mainstream systems in the field? 
How do we take pockets of innovation and scale what they're doing throughout the defense enterprise? It's not that we can't do this. We can and we do, but it has got to be easier and it has got to be faster. Think about stealth aircraft, for example. If you compare when DARPA initiated the project that led to the first experimental stealth aircraft, Have Blue, to when we fielded an operational F-117 Nighthawk, that took nearly a decade. It took another decade for stealth technology to be incorporated into an operational B-2 bomber. And another decade or two after that for stealth to become mainstreamed across much of our combat aircraft fleet in the form of the F-22 and the F-35 stealth fighters. Perhaps that timeline was tolerable in the Cold War when our main strategic competitor was relatively lumbering and slow. But today, we have to evolve faster than the threats evolve, which means our capabilities must be designed and built to be flexible, adaptable, and interoperable from the beginning. We must keep building and growing our enduring advantage. Simply put, we don't have decades to wait for the latest and greatest concepts and capabilities to proliferate across our military forces. We have to shrink that lab to fab timeline from decades to years or even months, which means we've got to be thinking early and often about what happens after DARPA proves a concept and prototypes a capability. Who carries the ball forward and how? As we go forward, greater collaboration, thinking and acting across sectors, across borders, and close coordination with our friends and allies will be even more important. Because there is so much great innovation happening beyond our walls, whether it's in the commercial sector or in the science and technology ecosystems of other democracies. As a nation and together with those allies and partners, we have what it takes and any other country that might doubt our ability, our ingenuity, our commitment and resolve should think again. This past month should remind us of that. Here in Washington, August is usually a pretty quiet month, but look at what's happened. President Biden signed a bipartisan Chips and Science Act that will supercharge America's semiconductor research, development, and most importantly, production. We also got the biggest expansion of healthcare and benefits for veterans and their families in decades, also bipartisan. And that's not even to mention historic legislation to lower prescription drug costs, healthcare costs, and energy costs, and do the most we've ever done to combat cl the climate crisis and improve America's energy security. President Biden said it best just last week. We are the United States of America, and there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. And we, the people of the United States, have it within us to bring the creativity and focus and effort that's required to win the competition for the 21st century. So let me close with a simple ask. Help us address the challenges I've described today, or better yet, help us solve the problems we haven't even considered yet. Think about how your expertise can help make a difference because it could end up making all the difference. As we in the Department of Defense confront our pacing challenge, we're in a persistent competition for advantage. It's all hands on deck because we know our lead is never guaranteed. We have to earn it constantly. And whether you're interested in the future of autonomous vehicles or powering the next generation of communications technologies or building resilience in the face of a warming planet, at DOD, we've got something for practically everyone. We have some of the most fantastic problems to solve and our mission is second to none. It's not only a chance to make a difference, it's a chance to be part of something bigger than yourselves, to change the future for the better, to make the world safer for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. And we have questions that'll be coming in from the audience, um, but while they catch up, um, I'm gonna use director's privilege to ask one of my own. So, uh, you've recently visited several government and research facilities around the country, and you got to meet with people in the labs and discuss advanced technology priorities. During those stops, you touched on several of the themes that you just discussed, including collabor collaboration across different sectors and disciplines is vital to U.S. strategic competition. This is a, a key goal for DARPA Forward as well. 
So what would you ask of those here at DARPA Forward, the researchers from across all of these different sectors and disciplines, to do to ensure we are prepared for the next great national security challenges? Well, great, thanks so much, Stephanie, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Um, I have done quite a bit of visiting all sorts of entities, including our national labs, which are true treasures um, in the innovation system that we have here in the United States. But whether it's there or with uh, folks in the commercial sector or universities, and, and I've met with folks in all those communities, um, I think what really drives people forward together is the mission. And what I would ask is to keep that mission focus on what we can accomplish together. Um, help to push us, as I said in my remarks, to look at the right problems, think about problems that maybe we haven't already identified. Um, but you can always go to DOD websites and, and understand very much what those challenges are we believe we face um, in, in the nation state realm. And as I said, many of the transboundary issues that we face like climate change. So understand the problems. Help us get beyond our um, uh, own thinking into what are some of the solutions that are out there. Many of those solutions we know, and increasingly so, will come out of the non-defense sector uh, simply because of the nature of the challenges we face and the incredible vibrancy of the ecosystem beyond defense. So making sure we can lower our barriers and work effectively um, with those who are trying to bring solutions is my challenge and what I'd ask people um, on the other side of that seeming fence to do um, is be ready to engage and help us understand how we can uh, fit in better with uh, the way in which you work uh, to get solutions to the warfighter for ourselves. Thank you. All right, we have our first audience question and I'm gonna tell you up front, this is a little bit unfair. I'm really glad they're not asking me. Um, among the many technologies that DARPA and the DOD are working on, which one would be your highest priority? Yeah, that is unfair. Um, so what I, I'm not gonna say it's the highest priority. I will say at the top of my list of uh, challenges right now is making sure that we can increase speed of decision, quality and speed of decision um, and action. And there are a lot of different technologies that come together, a lot of different organizational innovations and operational concepts that come together to make that kind of command and control speed of decision um, improve. So that's at the top of my list. Obviously, cloud uh, enterprise cloud capability is a piece of that. Um, AI and, and making sure we take best advantage of data, ensure we have quality data. We do all of that in a responsible way. Um, those are some of the technology areas I'm focused on to get to that operational end state. What are some current or future military operational challenges that you think might not be getting enough technical attention to, rope, to appropriately, appropriately prepare for them? Yep, I mentioned one of them just now. I, I won't linger on it because I just talked about it, which is sometimes called JADC2, which is just uh, we want to really make sure we're even better. You know, the United States has such a strong history of joint operations. We're pretty good at it. Uh, we want to get even better at it. We always want to build on advantage, and we think we have a real opportunity there. Um, but another I think I would uh, highlight is on um, improving our ability to untether on fuel. Um, so making sure we can operate in really remote environments. There's a lot of different technologies that can be brought in um, to play there. Autonomy is certainly part of that. Um, a, a green technology in terms of whether it's a, a f on the fuel side or on the, if you will, installations um, side of things, there's a lot of capability there. Um, so we need to make sure that we can operate anywhere in the world where it's in the interest of the United States to protect its citizens or um, allies and, and, and pursue advantage. Um, so that requires us to not have these hard logistics tails Additive manufacturing is another capability that can really help us there. Thank you for that. And we've been having some great conversations already about changing some of the assumptions and weaknesses in both supply chains and logistics. So how are we leveraging our technological advantages to help our Indo-Pacific partners to develop their own defense capabilities? First of all, AUKUS is right at the top of that. And for those who may not be aware, AUKUS is the US, Australia, and um, uh, Great Britain coming together uh, in an intentional way to focus on how we can um, achieve mutual advantage by sharing on the research and development and ultimately production side on technology. Um, there are a couple different aspects of that. The, the, the uh, one big 
pillar one, it's called one big area is undersea warfare capability and making sure we can mutually strengthen our undersea capabilities. Again, that's an area of advantage for the United States um, and uh, its Western allies. Uh, so making sure we can keep that as an enduring advantage will require us to continue staying at the cutting edge of that technology. There are lots of other technology areas where we think there's opportunity for the three countries to work together to more rapidly advance and field, very importantly, field those capabilities. So I would put AUKUS right up at the front of that. But we don't stop there. We have many other bilateral, trilateral, and even in the case um, uh, of Asia, a quad approach where we're constantly working with others on the operational challenges they face. I'll say again, some of our um, uh, Asia Pacific partners are focused more than anything on climate change. So sometimes it's something like that where their defense communities are very focused on the existential risk if they're island nations, for instance. And sometimes it's all the way up at the higher end of uh, potential warfare, making sure that they can um, uh, uh, protect themselves against um, anything from hypersonic uh, missile systems to nuclear capabilities that could be put forward and everything in between. We meet allies and partners where they are on the things they want to work on together. There's a lot of opportunity in that. And we also, by taking that approach, by focusing on ensuring stability in the region, rather than um, trying to um, um, increase tensions, uh, we become the partner of choice for many in the region. That protects us economically and it protects us in our security realm. Thank you. So and we all acknowledge, and you've already said, we need a new generation of innovators to be excited about finding solutions to national security challenges. Um, you know, one of the best things here about DARPA Forward is we have been engaging with graduate students, um, with postdocs, with a lot of young faculty and, and, and young researchers, and the energy is just tremendous. Could you expand on the department's efforts to broaden the talent pipeline and in turn the DOD innovation ecosystem so that we're prepared for those challenges that, that uh, we're looking forward towards? Sure, so um, when I uh, came in to this position uh, and the secretary and I sat down to talk through some of our initial impressions from both being back here uh, and we both have uh, a pretty strong histories inside DOD. Um, there were a couple things that really stood out to us and your question really hits at the intersection of two of them. Um, one is that the department didn't have a senior level focused set of processes or uh, governance systems on workforce issues. It's pretty stunning actually. You, you often will hear out of DOD uh, leaders throughout the decades, um, you know, of course, people are our priority, you know, everything is about people. But if you look at the way we spend time and focus our efforts as leaders inside the Pentagon, uh, that was not manifesting um, the way, for instance, we were spending time on um, weapon systems or maybe just uh, the overall uh, budget process. So to go after that, we established a Deputies Workforce Council, which I chair. Um, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, uh, helps me lead that, and we work with the senior leadership all across the department to look at workforce issues. Another big area uh, I noted is that we had many wonderful flowers blooming on innovation um, across the department. It's a vast department. We have many um, activities underway, which are very impressive, but we weren't looking at a system. Um, we still probably aren't really looking at a system, but we want to get uh, much more effective uh, so we can learn from each other, just as you're doing with DARPA Forward here. You're learning from each other inside DOD and then beyond DOD with those outside our walls. Um, but to do that, again, we need some kind of way to connect communities. And so I established an innovation steering group, which our uh, Undersecretary for Research and Engineering now chairs. Now at the intersection of these two issues comes the, what you might call the innovation workforce tech talent, people can frame it up under its you know, STEM, but it's beyond STEM talent. Um, it also includes how we think about the acquisition workforce, those who are going out and trying to determine what we buy and how we buy it, helping those who are de deciding what to buy with how we buy it. Um, and so I've established now an innovation tiger team, uh, innovation workforce, excuse me, tiger team at the intersection of these two areas to take a quick look at all the work that's been done in the past, and there is a lot. What can we build on quickly? We have a lot of support on Capitol Hill to help us um, with everything from direct hire authorities 
So a first question is, well, do we do use all the direct hire authorities that we have? The answer is no. Some parts of DOD do better than others. So how do we make use of the authorities we've already been given better? Um, another question is uh, sort of where do we, do we know where we need the talent and what talent we need? Talent identification is also a big issue. Again, some organizations have a good sense of the tech talent that they need. And I will point out that the research and engineering community is among those that's very good at understanding where their gaps are. But there are other parts of the department where we don't. And I'll point to things like um, our, our data and AI work where we really are starting to build um, from a, a much newer base of understanding of what the department needs and develop out uh, a plan for that workforce. So it's gonna take us a little time to work through um, those pieces, but it won't take uh, years. We're aiming to get uh, on a cycle that for the next budget year um, that we, we have underway here in the department, we will have a number of solutions to bring forward to Congress in their next legislative cycle, in other words, which, which will kick off in the spring. Um, but we know it's a challenge. We know it's hard to work with DOD. We know sometimes it's hard to work for DOD. So we're going at all pieces of that. Security clearance process reform is another big one that we know is a challenge. Um, and we just really uh, applaud anyone who wants to come work with us. We thank you for sticking with us and being so mission driven. And now we owe it to you to make it um, both a, a, a job that's rewarding, that you're rewarded for monetarily and that we can get you into in a reasonable amount of time. Thank you. I think that's a perfect uh, answer on which to end the, the session. We have tons more questions, but we're super respectful of your time and very, very grateful um, that you were able to find the time to be with us today. So. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And again, thank you for doing uh, DARPA Forward. It's a great event series, and I look forward to it continuing for years into the future. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. All right. <laughs>